Um, I was thinking this week as I started uh, um, thinking about having to preach. I haven't done it for a while, did you notice? <laughs> I went on holiday, and then the baby came early, so I didn't manage to preach at all in between that, so I'm, I'm back. And I was thinking about preaching this week, and I was putting it off, and I was saying, man, this is hard. I was procrastinating. I always find another uh, you know, way to find an- another reason to have a coffee with bread or do something else or come and have a look at what's happening with the building. I tell you what, there's a lot to be interested in around here when, when you want to be. Uh, so it struck me as a little bit ironic when I sat down to look at the, um, the, the proverb that I had decided to preach on this week, which said to me, a sluggard does not plough in season, so at harvest time he looks and finds nothing. I thought I better up my game and get on to this sermon, otherwise there'll be nothing to show for it come Sunday morning. So that is our proverb this morning, Proverbs 20 verse 4, a sluggard does not plough in season, so at harvest time they look but find nothing. Before we get to that though, let's just remind ourselves uh, what we're doing here. Uh, We're going through a short series in Proverbs, Um, it's loosely around discipleship, living God's way. Uh, Proverbs has a lot to say about living God's way and it has a lot to say about the contrast between those who reject God. Uh, and do not love them, and they're called the foolish a lot in Proverbs, or the scoffers, or uh, yes, even the sluggards, or the lazy. Uh, And contrast that to, on the other hand, those who seek God and strive to love with all their heart, soul, and strength. Uh, They're called the wise, the humble, or the diligent. Uh, So Proverbs has a lot to say about this. It has a lot to say about what life may well look like if you base decisions on your own experience and understanding compared to a life in line uh, with a loving father, a God who is infinitely wise, and a saviour who is altogether gracious. Proverbs has a lot to say about a lot of things, in fact. Uh, Has anybody read right through them? Man, you get, uh, it's large and long. Uh, You get the feeling as as you're reading them that if you could only absorb all of these into your life, you'd be a really wise person. And, but they kind of keep slipping past or eluding you. You know, I've heard it explained to me the difference between knowledge and wisdom. It's probably good to think about. Uh, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit, apparently. Uh, but wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> keep hold of that. That's another proverb for you this morning. Uh, you know, we can often uh, know things about God, but fail to translate them into life. We know a lot about Jesus dying on the cross, but perhaps not so much about dying to ourselves and carrying our own cross and what that means and in life. We know a lot about how to, how to live God's way, but don't seem to do it. I don't know if you've ever had this problem like me. In other words, we might be full of knowledge, but we keep putting tomatoes in the fruit salad, if you know what I'm saying. So Proverbs is a great place, a good place to go if your fruit salad's not tasting so good, right? It's a good place to go to be discipled into wisdom, if you like, the wisdom of God. God speaks to us through these Proverbs, doesn't he, and helps us see how to get this knowledge that we might uh, have of him uh, from here down to here into our hearts and then out into our lives. Uh, Or put the other way around, to have a life lived out, truly lived out, as a follower of Jesus. It's about growing in wisdom. And you could say, perhaps, it's about becoming a walking proverb, which is, after all, being like Jesus. So all in all, Proverbs is a good place to start, isn't it? To spend a few weeks um, considering this stuff. And perhaps it's a bit short. We could have spent a lot longer going through Proverbs talking about this idea of discipleship and living God's way and being wise or not foolish, depending on which way you look at it. But hopefully, uh, even these three weeks we do, will encourage you to go back to Proverbs and perhaps read what God is saying to us from them in terms of wisdom. So, Proverbs 20, verse 4. Let's hear it again. A sluggard does not plough in season, so at harvest time he looks but finds nothing. Uh, A simple, simpler translation perhaps is the uh, CEV, uh, contemporary English, it simply says this, if you are too lazy to plough, don't expect a harvest. 
But sluggard is such a great word. Come on. I'm going to stick with the NIV. And, and I'll probably say sluggard a lot during the sermon because it is a word. I think we should bring it back into our uh, vocabulary so we can uh, take those opportunities to call people uh, on things that they are not doing. So a sluggard, uh, what a word. So uh, sluggard, and if you search sluggard, you'll find it a lot in Proverbs, right? So you can start to see what this type of person is like. And there's some really great Proverbs that kind of give us a picture of this. Proverbs 26, 14 especially. Uh, a door turns and squeaks on its hinges. Uh, so does a sluggard on his bed. Uh, or this one, the very next verse, a sluggard buries his hand into the dish and it wearies him. It wearies him to bring it back out to his mouth. Or the excuse that a sluggard gives for not going to work. Uh, 26.13, there's a lion in the road. Uh, there's a lion roaming the streets. <laughs> yeah, right. We may, we may well laugh at these and feel they're pretty inconsequential sort of proverbs, perhaps. You know, they're just about a lazy person. What's wrong with that? We're all lazy sometimes. We always all find a reason to have another cup of coffee or uh, I've already confessed that for me this morning or perhaps to stay in bed a bit longer or uh, to do this. Coming up next. <laughs> What's the big deal? But what we see as we continue to uh, read through Proverbs is that there's a more long-term seriousness to the profession of being a sluggard. And even more importantly, the long-term seriousness of being a sluggard when it comes to the things of God. And we begin to hear this sort of thinking even in this proverb before us this morning. A sluggard does not plough in season, so at harvest he looks but finds nothing. Now we could take this literally, of course, and see literal long-term consequences of being lazy when it comes to ploughing and planting. Uh, the uh, greenhouse that is attached to the veggie stall, supplying produce, is, um, uh, is going to run out soon from the season of summer produce. Now Matt could be a sluggard. Um, we know he's not, actually, but he could be and decide that he's just going to take a break for the winter and have more cups of coffee and uh, sleep in and walk his dog with the car and not plant anything. And come next summer, what would we find? Well, we had no produce coming in to the, uh, to the veggie store. Uh, there is a time to plant. Who has not um, planted their tomatoes in time? You know, I try and plant tomatoes in our greenhouse for our fruit salad. Uh, and... <laughs> I often get them in way too late, or last year I discovered I hadn't even got them in at all. I didn't have any tomatoes. Uh, it's all too easy to miss the time that we should be doing things. However, I suspect that this simple lesson of gardening that this proverb reminds us of uh, also points to a much larger principle of life, doesn't it? A larger principle of life lived under God as a disciple of Jesus. You see, ploughing and harvesting in God's in Scripture and God's Word is so often linked uh, to our spiritual life and our walk with God and as a result the growth of His kingdom. And ultimately we see that in, in the harvest as God will wrap all up at the end of time in a new creation. The harvest of people, His people. But we can also take uh, passages for instance like the, the parable of the sower, Matthew 13. A farmer went out to sow a seed, and some fell on hard ground, some on rocky ground, some among thorns, while other seed fell on good soil, ploughed soil. The seed that fell on good soil, uh, the ploughed soil produced a crop 30, 60, 100 times that that was sown. If you read this parable right through, Jesus helps us and explains it. It's one of the best parables in Scripture. Uh, and you'll see that what he says is that the ground that wasn't ploughed, that was either hard or full of rocks or, or weeds, is likened to the human heart that is hardened to God's truth or, or, that doesn't, or that is more concerned with the worries of the world, with wealth and possessions or lust and, and greed, or is more concerned or it, or it struggles to face up against the pressures of the world that push against the ways of God. And so with a heart like that, how can God's truth grow and produce a fruit? 
in this person? How can a person that has hard ground, has a hard heart, and struggles to uh, accept God's truth in, in ways, be changed to be more and more like Jesus, to be a better follower of Jesus? If the words of Jesus don't stick to us and not only get in here, but down to here, how can God produce the fruit of his kingdom? Justice and righteousness, love and peace and hope and joy, people coming to faith through others, fellowship, unity. How can God produce that and grow that in someone if they are hardened to the things of God? And so here's the rub. This good soil that God requires in us must be ploughed. And to plough means effort and ongoing commitment and sacrifice and obedience to God's ways, even if we don't like it or it's inconvenient to us. This effort and obedience is not to earn God's favour, remember. No, no, let's never be tempted to go along that track. We are saved by grace and grace alone. But rather it's the responsibility that comes with entering into a relationship with the very creator of the universe. The covenant relationship that I talked about earlier when we baptised Sophie uh, requires us to be faithful in return to his faithfulness. And as a result, we are promised, promised by God himself, that this blessing will come, the fruit, the harvest, as he works through us in his strength. Being lazy or a sluggard for the things of God will not only mean his abundant life and joy and peace and beauty and hope and all those good things of God will elude us, but also means we'll be less and less attracted to them because we'll be more and more attracted to the world. Proverbs 13.4 also speaks of the sluggard, that the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. You know, I realise that given uh, that proverb and how it contrasts the sluggard with the diligent, that we could actually uh, come up with the opposite of our proverb this morning. Uh, So, instead of a sluggard does not plough in season, uh, so at harvest time he looks and finds nothing, we can say that the diligent do plough in season, so at harvest time they will look and see fruit. You know, it takes effort to plough the ground. We need to be diligent. But if you don't put that effort in, there'll be nothing to show for it when the time comes. It takes effort to make sure you have good soil that the seed of God's word can be planted in and grow and produce a harvest of righteousness. But if you don't put that effort in, you'll have nothing to show for it when the time comes. 2 Corinthians 9.10 makes the same link. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. It's God who enlarges the harvest of our righteousness. In other words, the things we do that God uses for his kingdom, for growing his kingdom. You know, we're graduating four interns today. And I think what we're doing in a way is acknowledging that they have done a year or two, as the case may be, and they're about to do another year of ploughing and seeing harvest and fruit. I could have picked another proverb that perhaps may have suited our interns a little bit better, um, the part they've played in the life that they uh, bring and give to St. Stephen's, um, or how we uh, might respond to them. Proverbs 12.1, uh, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Uh, I don't know if they'd like that one. Uh, um, this one, Brad and I wondered about, uh, better to be, a low, to be lowly and have a servant, or four of them, than play the great man and lack bread. Uh, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall, maybe. Uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Oh, no, sorry, did I say that one out loud? <laughs> uh, nothing I say from the front here. Nothing I say from the front here reflects the official policy of our our internship program. Uh, Should we get back to Proverbs 24? I think we should. A slugger does not plough in season, so at harvest time he looks but finds nothing. As I was thinking about this this week, about how 
in a very real sense, our internship program is set up to help these interns plough in season, uh, to encourage them to be diligent, uh, into a diligent life uh, that translates into the fruit of righteousness, that translates by God's grace into disciples who serve and love and lead for the sake of God's kingdom. People who are open to God's leading reflect his righteousness and so are more equipped and more ready for God to work through them to do what God wants. And what's great is they signed up to this, literally. They signed up to it. Sure, they can choose their area of ministry that they want to um, focus on uh, as part of their internship, but they're giving a supervisor and a mentor. They have to meet them uh, uh, often and be told and challenged and held accountable. They have a ministry training plan that looks at um, their conviction of faith, their character and competence, and grows them in those things. Uh, They're invited into a three-year program to explore the first year, develop the second, and lead the third. That sounds pretty intensive. Uh, This year they're required, or we're looking at requiring them, compulsory, to meet at 7 a.m. on Monday mornings for an hour. I don't know if we've told you that yet, but anyway, it's coming your way. Uh, For prayer, devotion, accountability again. Uh, They're forced into a community living situation. We've got three houses now that are linked in in Tahuna to do that and expected to live in a missional way. Uh, And surely they're expected to say yes when asked any mundane task that Brad and I want them to do, right? Uh, Actually, I had two of them here last night, late, tidying up the church at late notice. You know what was funny? I realised when I look back at the original training plans that we gave them that we actually had this idea written in, not even in the small print. It says this, um, under character, that they are to develop humility. Are you listening? Where are you all? (laughs) Develop humility to take on unattractive tasks when necessary. I don't know why we took that out. Man. And on top of all this, it's generally a 10-hour voluntary internship, but I guarantee you that if you added up the hours that these guys spend, there'd be a lot more than 10 hours each. What else is all this? What else is all this if not ongoing opportunities to ensure that the fields continue to be ploughed and prepared in the lives of these interns? What else is all this if not going on, ongoing opportunities to see the harvest and the fruit of a committed and diligent life following Jesus. And they signed up to all this, and they continue to sign up to it. I think they signed up to it because these guys aren't sluggards, right? They signed up because they know that God wants them to continue putting the effort in, plowing and preparing in season, and God wants them to continue bearing fruit uh, for him. Now, as they serve here, And for whatever harvest God calls them to in the future when we send them out from St. Stephen's as missionaries to North China. Maybe. Maybe not. But you get my point. That, people, is why we should be celebrating and rejoicing with and for these interns today. And we're going to get a chance to do that. I want you to clap loudly when we do. I want us to sing loudly at the end when we do, because this is God's work of ploughing and bearing fruit. But this should also challenge us, shouldn't it? These interns are sorted. They've well and truly, I think, avoided the title of being sluggards. But remember this proverb that we're looking at is a pearl of wisdom for all of us. A sluggard does not plough in season, so at harvest time he he looks but finds nothing. But the diligent person ploughs in season, so at harvest time they will look and see fruit. If we say yes to Jesus, and in our hearts set him apart as Lord, and trust and believe that he died on the cross for us, for our sins, when we say that and sign up to a life as a follower of Jesus, whether that's 20 years ago or whether that's today, we have to ask, What are we doing to ensure that the fields are ploughed? To ensure that our hearts are continually moulded and shaped for God? In other words, are we being diligent in seeking God through his word, through prayer, through the advice and support of others, through gathering together? Or are we being lazy in our commitment to God and possibly in danger of earning the title 
of Sluggard. So as we continue to seek these things, and here at St. Stephen's as we continue to know God and make him known, uh, we really, I guess, want to move people from being sluggards to diligent. And we've got five values that we stand on that help us do that and help us realise the idea of to know God and make him known. And these five values are these, centred in Christ, committed to prayer, taking God's word seriously, growing in unity and impacting our communities. You know, I think we could almost retitle these values as the five marks of a disciple who is not a sluggard. Couldn't we? Think about that for a moment. Committed to prayer, uh, centered in Christ, committed to prayer, taking God's word seriously, growing in unity, impacting our communities. Now you can do some of this stuff on your own, can't you? You can ensure plowed fields. We can, uh, we've got these uh, bookmarks that you can read the Bible at home on your own even. Did you know that? Uh, and this helps us just open up God's word and say, what is God saying to us? And praying about it. Uh, these are available. I talked about them a while ago. There's opportunities to uh, gather for prayer here at St. Stephen's on Saturday or Wednesday morning's men's prayer. Uh, there's opportunities to serve. All these things is how God works through us to cultivate good ground and bear fruit. Another opportunity that we're always really excited about as we launch uh, again for the year is our discipleship pathway. Uh, our discipleship pathway goes through DNA St. Stephen's, Life St. Stephen's, and Equip St. Stephen's. And DNA is starting very soon, so sign up uh, if you haven't done DNA. It basically looks at the foundations of our faith as it's given in the Apostles' Creed and helps us start ploughing through that uh, and understanding what that means for us and how God takes those foundations and lives them out through his church here. Uh, there's also these flyers if you want to know more about the discipleship pathway. You could also become an intern. And we keep saying that doesn't have to be uh, if you're only uh, young. You can be 65 and be an intern at St. Stephen's. You know, following Jesus is not easy. Jesus, in fact, says, count the cost before signing up to it. Following Jesus is a call to sacrifice. Sacrifice of time, of money, of energy, of the things we love, perhaps about this world. It's a commitment. It requires diligence, effort. Leonardo da Vinci said this, O oh Lord, thou givest us everything, but at the price of effort. We have to understand that this is how God works. It's his modus operandi, if you like. It has to be. Because in order for him to work through us, through the people that he calls his own, to reveal his glory, to grow his kingdom, to know him and make him known, then those people must be open to being shaped and moulded, ploughed, into a disciple that he can use, into a church that he can use. That's what this proverb says to us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, you call us to an amazing thing. You invite us in to be part of what you're doing in the world through your Son, Jesus Christ, and in the strength of your Holy Spirit. Father, pray that we see the privilege of that. And Lord, we need your strength, though, to step up, to be diligent, to be open to being shaped and moulded as a disciple, even to growing faith and calling us to faith. Lord, we need your strength in your work, you at work. Lord, pray that as we consider Proverbs, as we consider what it means to be wise instead of a fool, as we consider what it means to be diligent instead of a sluggard, as we consider what it means to be humble instead of proud, pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to how you take that sort of person and use them to bear fruit for your kingdom. Use them to grow your church, to call others to yourself, to comfort, to support. And 
And Lord, we thank you that in doing these things, in being diligent, in being uh, committed to your work, that's not how we earn our favour with you. It's not how we earn our salvation. We are saved by grace and grace alone. And Lord, we simply want to respond to that grace and what you've done in our lives and commit ourselves wholly and fully to you. Lord, raise us from spiritual death to spiritual life. Stir in us a spirit that says yes to you in all things. And Lord, may we be encouraged and rejoice in the fruit that we see from that. In Jesus' name. Amen.